So uh, we're talking about diagnostics, uh, tests which aid in the diagnosis of disease. Um, and these tests have inherent characteristics such as sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Uh, each test has a likelihood ratio, and this modifies uh, the pretest probability of uh, the probability of a disease. And so it helps us rule in or rule out disease. And the most important uh, utility for, for diagnostics is really when you have cases where you're not really sure what's going on. Because for instance, if it's a dengue case and the platelets are going down, um, it pretty much gives you a good clinical diagnosis. But for instance, if in patients who have intermediate probability of heart disease, then it's important to be able to confirm or rule out that diagnosis because it can change the outcome in terms of whether you do some sort of uh, intervention or not, especially when those interventions are invasive. The best results are always what we call the gold standard, uh, for instance, a tissue diagnosis, but it's not always all that practical because you can have uh, very invasive diseases or in the cases of autopsies, you know, the results, you know what happened to the patient, but unfortunately it comes too late. And for infectious diseases in particular, uh, when we talk about a gold standard, more often than not, it's really culture because you're growing the organism and you're able to test the organism. So abilities, you're able to test for characteristics, which more or less tells you that that is uh, what you're dealing with. Now, the pearls of culture are that they're highly specific, and obviously recovery of an organism is a sine qua non, and it, it's there. So it's very difficult to dispute the presence of something when, when, when it's growing right in front of you. However, in general, culture, cultures are very expensive. They're highly technical. They're also prone to contamination, which reduces their utility if that happens. At the same time, uh, it has low sensitivity. I'm sorry, it's not specificity, but low sensitivity. Um, in fact, they, they, they think that blood cultures, a single blood culture is only about 60% sensitive. And you may miss uh, different, uh, different uh, organisms, especially those that are difficult to grow. And it can have a long turnaround time, and uh, especially for slow-growing organisms. Like for instance, for, um, for tuberculosis, uh, it can take about eight weeks before you have an answer from a culture standpoint. And for unculturable or difficult to culture organisms, uh, traditionally we've looked at antibody barriers using either ELISA, indirect chemoillumination, or other laboratory techniques. And these have been highly sensitive and specific. They've been fairly successful, but they typically require either paired convalescera, where you actually demonstrate an increase in titers to definitively demonstrate infection, but it can still be highly technical. Uh, you may need a laboratory to, to, to do these kinds of tests. False positives, especially when you're dealing with immunoglobulin M, which is very sticky because it's a pentamer. I mean, a lot of us have had cases where both the IgM for typhoid and dengue are positive, and you're not really sure what to do with those. And the single titer may not uh, necessarily give you uh, a good idea, and you cannot distinguish between current and past infection. For instance, if you talk about leptospirosis, a lot of people may have low levels of leptospire antibodies uh, just because of constant exposure, but that does not necessarily correlate to active disease. And uh, looking at newer techniques that have become conventional for us or usually is, for instance, conventional PCR techniques, which uh, previously were used to amplify genetic material but they're actually very good for detecting unculturable or difficult to culture organisms. This is a very sensitive test and it's very specific as well because you're talking about a very specific uh, genetic uh, signature and uh, you only need very small amounts of material. But again, highly technical, it's relatively expensive although the cost uh, keeps going down and it's not standardized. A lot of labs have their own protocols. We call them homebrews. And of course, it's easily contaminated because um, if you have uh, just a little bit of uh, contaminated, contaminating material, say it's like kind of floating out in the air um, and it lands on your, on your PCR mix, you can actually end up with a false positive in that sense. So there's a lot of next generation diagnostics. And uh, for our intents and purposes, we'll focus on about uh, five of them. 
uh, we want to think about simplification of all tests, with, uh, of all, all tests, which uh, are really antibody tests. Uh, for instance, the HIV antibody rapid test, which is now point of care. Also, antigen tests like sandwich elizas, which we're now using for malaria and for dengue. Uh, multiplex real-time PCR or quantitative PCR. Uh, RT-PCR is, uh, is different. And uh, such as Luminex multiplex assays and micro array platforms. Also, a gene expert, which is a real time PCR with molecular beacons to detect resistance. And there's more of these coming up. Uh, for Because of time constraints, we're not really going to talk about next generation sequencing at this time. But that is a very, very exciting area of molecular biology where we're able to do multiple populations of, of, of quasi species. Um, and are better at characterizing viral populations. There's also another very thing called Malditov, um, uh, which is really a time of flight mass spectroscopy, which gives specific characteristics to certain organisms. So, for instance, if you're looking at a bacterial culture and you do Malditov on it, you can actually identify that organism uh, within, within hours as opposed to days with, with the cultures. And of course, you can combine all these little techniques where you have multi-assay uh, microfluidics, like lateral flow assays. We have these microfluidic tests where you're testing for all the STDs known to man on one, on one, one plate for instance, HIV, syphilis, and then there, we'll talk about uh, an assay that is homegrown and was developed in our institute by Dr. Raudis Dura, which is called the Biotech M lamp assay, which uh, looks at the genetic signature of, um, which basically looks at the genetic signature of, deng of dengue, and uh, uh, it comes out to be a much cheaper but more accurate test than what's commercially available. So let's start with the first one, where we're simplifying old tests to make them near or point of care. And this usually uses techniques called lateral flow assays or microfluidics, so you're using Na the nanoparticles and miniaturized materials to simulate what big big equipment does in a very small space, and so you need very little um, very little sample, and you also have a very fast reaction because you're dealing with very small amounts of of material. So, for instance, if you think about the, probably the oldest point of care test you can think about is maybe a pregnancy test, which actually. Um, uh, is a lateral flow assay. Now, for infectious diseases, uh, we're using it routinely for, um, for HIV, where you can actually do an HIV test in about 20 minutes. And it really is like a pregnancy test, where you actually see a line uh, go positive, it's positive, or just a control line if it's negative. And this is usually useful for detecting either antibodies or antigens. Technically, it's a lot easier to look at antibodies, but antigens, as we'll see in the next, um, uh, example uh, can be detected as well. And there's a lot of newer microfluidic techniques where they basically have injected molded plastic on a nano scale that you can do different kinds of things that you can only do with much bigger pieces of equipment. Um, so for HIV antibody and microfluidic HIV syphilis tests, um, these basically use a, um, for instance, a, a test line. Here in this uh, example, it's actually uh, an, an anthrax antigen, and it's looking at protective antibodies against anthrax. And so if you have a sample that has the antibodies, these go through and take along a label um, uh, antibodies with microparticles, and these stick to the antigen, um, to, I'm sorry, this, these stick to the antigen that's on the line and these can be detected uh, uh, because there is the nanoparticle that can either fluoresce or give you a, a colored reaction. And then this is just an example of uh, how extensive uh, you can make microfluidics because different characteristics on the nanoparticle level can give you a simulation of much bigger machines. So you can actually have what we call a lab on a stick or a lab on a plate, uh, because all these things can be simulated on a plate so that even though it's a very complicated reaction or a series of complicated reactions, you can have meaningful results. It doesn't only save uh, money, it saves a lot of time, and it makes very sophisticated 
tests available near point of care or even without the use of expensive equipment. Now, looking at antigen tests, which are slightly different from antibody tests, this is where you're actually using monoclonal antibodies to capture uh, the antigen that's present in a body fluid, say in the blood or in the sputum and the saliva. Um, and these are superior to antibody tests because antibody tests, um, they uh, basically look at the, the, uh, the, uh, something that the body produces uh, in response to an infection, but looking at antigen really looks for a piece of the organism and tells you that the organism is there. However, because antigens can last for a long time in the body, it's still not used as a test for cure. I mean, antibodies never were a test for cure because they can, they can last a lifetime, for instance, for, for um, a TPHA, which is used for syphilis, those last for a lifetime. But for antigen, um, it has a span, but it may take a while for it to go away. And if you have low disease burden and you have a limit to the infection of antigens, then low disease burden may occasionally give you false negatives, but never at the level of, say, microscopy or those kinds of things. So, for instance, the ICT filariasis card test looked at a circulating antigen to lymphatic filariasis and has really revolutionized uh, the elimination of lymphatic filariasis in the world. There are influenza antigen tests as well. There's the Binax malaria uh, serology test, which can also distinguish between falciparum and non-falciparum malaria. So if we look at, uh, say, this Binax, you can see that there are different control lines. It tells you whether there's a mixed infection if you have these three lines or falciparum if only two lines, uh, non-falciparum malaria if it's the bottom line or negative if there's there's only one control line. Or you take a look at lateral flow assay again, but instead of having a test line of antigen, you actually have a test line of antibodies, which then capture the antigen. And the antigen itself, you have nanoparticles that can be conjugated using the same free um, uh, monoclonal antibody as a detector. And at the end of it all, you, still, you also have your control panel to make sure that the assay is valid. Now, moving on, uh, we talked about PCR, which basically detects genetic material. Now, there's uh, the newer version of, uh, of PCR is called real-time PCR. We don't call it RT-PCR. We call it qPCR, which is quantitative PCR, because RT-PCR refers to reverse transcriptase PCR, which we use for retroviruses or mRNA, and that's a different matter. When we talk about real-time PCR, uh, we talk about quantitative PCR. And the reason it's called quantitative is because you can actually use it to, to quantify how much DNA or how much organism is in a sample. You can use this, you can do this either with non-specific uh, uh, compounds like cyber green, which grows, glows green in the presence of double-stranded DNA, or you can use uh, specific uh, probes that have fluorescent reporters. These are like Dachman or even type DNA probes are different kinds of ways to do this. But because you can have a one-to-one -one reaction, if you can detect those fluorophores, then you can actually um, determine how much uh, or how much organism, how much genetic material is in a sample. So for instance, if you're talking about viral loads for hepatitis C or HIV, uh, you do a real-time PCR so you have, have an idea of what the quantity of those uh, viruses is in, in, in the body fluids. Uh, multiplex PCR now uses different kinds of primer sets. So instead of using just one fluorophore, you can use it detects several organisms, several sets of, um, uh, of, of several sets of um, inf uh, several infections uh, going on in. Uh, several infections or whatever it is that uh, you're looking for. Now, the great thing about that is that, for instance, if you need to extract, uh, uh, you need to example, you only have to extract it once. As opposed to having five different reaction tubes, you only have one reaction tube and you're trying to, you're detecting several organisms off just one sample. 
And so for the former, for real-time PCR, you usually see it with HIV viral loads. And then for the latter, with multiplex PCR, you have respiratory virus panels. And I'll show you in the next. So when we're talking about Pac-Man probes, it's a very specific kind of probe. You actually have a, um, a primer that has on each end attached a uh, reporter and a quencher um, uh, fluorophore. So the, the quencher um, basically uh, um, uh, quenches the, the fluorescence. But when the um, primer is incorporated and Pac-Man excises the fluorophore, then it's away from the quencher. And so you will see a, a fluorescent signal. And so that one fluorescent signal represents one DNA one strand DNA amplification. Now when you talk about respiratory panels that are multiplex, then you use different primers. And each of those primers um, has a specific fluorophore. Or in this case, when you use Luminex, you have virus-specific microspheres because each microsphere, which has a different wavelength, is attached to a primer that is specific for a particular virus. So you can actually pull out different viruses um, from one specimen. If it's there, then you will detect it. Now, what about taking all these and putting them together in uh, a way in which you get even more information? So real-time PCR with molecular beacons to detect resistance. Now, you're looking at not just the detection of an organism, but also character, uh, characterizing um, the kind of um, the, the kind of resistance that's going on in that organism. So the most uh, mature of these platforms, the most widely used, is called the Gene Expert. And uh, what it is really, it's a self-contained washing, filtration, real-time PCR, and detection for applications using cartridges. Now, the Expert MPB RIF, which is what is being adopted, which is what is being adopted by WHO to replace uh, tuberculosis screening worldwide, is the most mature. But ex gene expert platform can also do HIV viral loads. It can also do um, uh, MRSA and different kinds of detection. So let's talk about expert MPD RIF, uh, which has a very high sensitivity specificity, greater than 95%. And the great part about this is number one, it replaces, it can replace your usual um, screening test uh, with sputum. And at the same time, it can give you an idea of whether you're dealing with multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Typically, it takes about eight weeks for a culture to come back, which tells you whether something has rifampicin resistance. You can get both the detection of tuberculosis and a preliminary test that says whether the, the tuberculosis is resistant or, uh, or susceptible to rifampicin within two hours. And because the whole thing is self contained, it's cartridge based, you only need the level of a medical technologist at a regular lab. They don't even need to know how to do PCR or molecular uh, techniques. All they need to do is know how to handle the samples and how to put the cartridge into the machine and it does the rest. So the output of expert RIF is detection of tuberculosis and the presence of rifampicin resistance. Now, how does it do this? If you look at the machine, um, basically you put the sputum in one of the cartridges, and if you put it all in there, you know, that's the end of your hands-on work after you transfer the sputum into the cartridge, and then the sample gets automatically filtered and washed, and then you get extraction, ultrasonic lysis, and then the DNA molecules are mixed with dry PCR reagents, and then the detection comes in there as well. And this is what it looks like. Test result, MPB detected, but rifampicin resistance not detected, if that's the case. And the time to result is less than two hours, one hour, 45 minutes. The other issue about this is because there's minimal handling of the organism, then there's less risk for the, um, for the person, for the lab tech who is handling it, as opposed to doing two or three sputums or growing it, which is even more uh, hazardous because you need a biosafety level two plus to handle those kinds of cultures. Now, how does it do this? It uses what we call molecular beacon technology. It's similar to TACMAN, but here you actually have a hairpin, hairpin loop of a primer which uh, basically has uh, a fluorophore and a quencher. And 
when it is when it finds a complementary strand, then the fluorophore and the quencher are 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 ripped apart basically, and so you see the fluorescence as the presence of the target. And if there's no target, then there's no fluorescence. And so what it does is uh, the RPOB gene uh, is responsible for uh, basically most uh, rifampicin resistance, about 95% of it. And they know specific mutations that occur on the RPOG, uh, RPOB gene. And so they And so if there is a mutation, then those beacons will not bind. So for instance, this is the RPOB gene, and you have different probes. You have five kinds of probes at different sections. So it basically covers the whole um, RPOB gene, which is 81 base pairs. And if you don't have resistance, then all of these probes will bind. And so you should see five fluorescent signals along with one control signal for a total of six fluorescent dyes being detected at the same time. So not only is gene expert uh, a processing machine, a PCR machine, um, it also is a detection machine and it looks at six different colors of these dyes. If one of the colors is missing, then that corresponds to a mutation in the RPOB gene. So if you don't get six fluorescent dyes, six fluorescent signals, then you know that there is uh, the possibility of rifampicin resistance. And this all happens within two hours. And then of course there's combinations of the platforms. Now the most mature is from our end, from the UP Manila uh, National Institutes of Health, is uh, the Biotech M, uh, the Biotech M platform. And this is a near point of care, it's about six, two to six hours. Uh, isothermal PCR. Now, isothermal PCR because uh, PCR polymerase chain reaction usually requires a machine that is a thermocycler. It has different um, different temperatures to denature the DNA, to anneal to denature again and again. But an isothermal PCR is set at one temperature, 65 degrees. And so it's much easier. All you need is a heating block at 65 degrees as opposed to a full a full-blown PCR machine that detects dengue in blood samples. And the phase three clinical trials have been completed, and the data shows that this has actually better performance than the current commercial products, which include IgM, IgG, NS1, at a fraction of the cost. This is locally developed technology for the Filipino people. And it is undergoing, um, uh, well, the trials are done, and uh, these, these are actually going to uh, come out uh, hopefully next year in a lot of the hospitals of the Department of Health. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it uses a reaction tube similar to this and lamp. Uh, it, it uses cyber green, which is a non-specific dye. If there are double-stranded DNA there, then you will see a fluorescent. It's like uh, these, these ones. So third and the fourth tubes and the fifth and the sixth tubes uh, show that uh, there is detectable organism in there. Now, LAMP is very, very complicated, but the way it works is that there are at least six primer sets. And what, what happens is at, the, at 65 degrees, because you have different areas amplifying, it's kind of like a zipper. Instead of having to denature it at 90 degrees, the, um, the primers that are working at different levels of the of the gene are actually pulling the double strands apart to serve as more substrates. And so you have a lot of turbidity and then eventually you can detect that with your uh, cyber view. So in summary, uh, next generation diagnostics have really increased our capacity to make timely diagnosis through innovative utilization of technology. Major advantages really include shorter time to resolve point of care or near point of care. And so that you can strike while the iron is at, in other words, you don't have to lose patients to, um, to follow up because they don't have the results yet. And there's increased sensitivity and specificity, increased information from samples, especially like in the case of multiplexing. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control, when they're doing 
um, disease surveillance, they actually have a machine which has a plate. You put one sample in and you can test for 5,000 different pathogens. And so that's a little bit extreme, but you can actually tailor that. For instance, in the Philippines, one of our more, um, uh, one of our more common dilemmas is whether a patient has dengue or typhoid or leptospirosis. You put all three of those on a lateral flow assay. Then you have a test that is very, very useful for making clinical decisions early in terms of whether you have to give an antibiotic or whether you have to admit a patient. And this also lends itself to automation. Disadvantages are maybe the systems are a bit more complex. But with automated systems, it actually makes it less complex because it takes it uh, out of the hands of the operator. There will be higher initial costs, especially for those which have proprietary technology. But in the long term, if you can actually cost-benefit analysis there, uh, cost-benefit ratio. Um, if used properly, uh, these technologies will help us take better, take better care of patients and reduce morbidity and mortality. Thank you.